What's up, guys? Welcome to the Offside Podcast, um, the number one podcast for soccer players to take their game to the next level using real-world stories from real-world pros in various fields uh, related to the game to not only improve your game, but to improve your life. Make sure you hit that subscribe button to show your support. Today, I have my good friend, Nate Leader. Um, what's up? How are you doing? First and foremost, Andrew, man, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And anybody who's watching this right now, just taking the time to better yourselves in football and life, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for all tuning in. And just by being here, you guys are on the right path. So I'm ready to dive in. Yeah, 100%, bro. And I'm going to, I'm gonna, I'm actually, so I, I was thinking about um, doing this uh, last, but I think I'm going to start, start out by doing this. I have a few questions from uh, my followers on Instagram for you specifically. So I'm going to, we'll, we'll get it started off with that, right? So what do you look for in a player as a, as a scout, when you go to, to games and when you get a, get a, a, a smell of a sniff of a player or whatever, and you go and watch them, what do you look for in, in a player? Perfect. Um, that's a great question. And first, before we start this, let me introduce myself for those of you yes, who do not do. know me. I'm a football agent from, no, 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 I'm a football agent from North America. Uh, I've scouted for clubs like FC Porto. I've done some work with Hoffenheim, a bunch of La Liga clubs. I just got off the phone today with another um, big agency out in Italy, actually. And they're looking for actually North American players with European passports now. So it's a very interesting and fun time for North American footballers who want to make that jump to Europe. Um, I've done transfers, transferring players domestically from MLS to Europe. And I've also done a lot of just representing of players myself, getting them contracts, whether that be in the MLS, with USL clubs, overseas, done it all. I've only done this for three years, but one of the younger agents in the game trying to change it because agents do have a bad um, reputation about taking yeah. advantage of players. We always hear those stories. So I'm here just working hard, doing the best for my players and protecting them. It's, yeah. it's been a journey. And I also do some scouting as well. So back to that question, Andrew, yeah. what do I look for? Yeah. What I look for first and foremost is talent. And there's a plethora of talent. And a lot of players do have it, but just above talent, what is going to make you stand out above talent? We all know you can watch football. You can be a fan of football. You don't even really need to understand the game to a certain extent to under, to watch a game and be like, wow, that player is good. But yeah. to be honest, in the football world, that's not good enough. Right. Being talented is not good enough. What we look for as a scout is we look for the intangibles. How does a player represent himself on the field? How does he react to things? What is his mental state while he's playing? How does he organize his team? What is his leadership roles? It's even right. gone scouting roles for me, I've done for MLS clubs as well. And it's been clubs asking me, what about the player's family situation? Like how is he as a person? What is his family situation? How does he, how does he warm up? Something as simple as warming up, because I've had I've had I've been in situations where I've had a player represented them to a club. The club came and watched them, and they said I didn't like the way he warmed up, so I literally left. Yeah, I didn't like the way he was warming up, so I just completely left. So yeah. a lot of those things that players don't really think matter do matter. Everything from the way you carry yourself, how you take coaching, because I've heard that so many times I've gotten reports and I always warn players about this. When you are going to play or when you're going to try out for a club, one, you never know who's watching. Two, being coachable and being liked will take you a lot further than just being talented. Yeah. Because, and I'm sure you've seen this as well. Andrew and I, for those who don't know, we've also played together growing up we're around the same age. So we know yeah. the same players. And when I look at the players who are playing pro right now, versus the talented players in our age pool, not a lot of the talented ones are playing pro, but yeah. a lot of the hardworking kids are playing pro that we would yeah. never bet would be. So right. you always always remember, you always have to put your best foot forward, be coachable. 
you have to have the talent first and foremost, because if you don't, no one's going to take a second look at you. And also play with confidence. I love watching players that you can tell are just confident on the ball, confident in what they do. Even if you're having a bad game, if you have the confidence and you have the hard work and you have the drive and you're working, that catches our eye as well. So I hope that helps answer your question. Yeah, and, I, and I've and i been talking a lot support. about this. I've been talking about a lot about this on, on my, you know, my stories and all that stuff is like the idea of confidence and so like that. And just get into that real, I'm just going to get into that real quick. It's just like, the 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 confident players you know they have a multiple they have multiple aspects to their confidence right so like they worked hard to get to that to that point so they believe that they belong there right so that's one thing the other thing is that there is a little you know a a, a sprinkle of arrogance in there as well like i can get anything done no one's going to be able to beat me right and so so i i definitely 100 see that i've seen very good players that are very technical and then they go into that next level. They get an opportunity at the next level, whether that's MLS, whether that's, you know, championship, whatever it is, right? And they they don't play well because they're not confident. They don't have that last piece of confidence that that they feel like they should be there, right? And, um, you know, I've definitely struggled with that, with that myself, you know, training with Atlanta United. There were some moments when I was like, oh, I don't really think I deserve to be here or whatever. And, and that happens, but you definitely hit it spot on that it t talent is not enough, you know? And, and what I, what I really want to get into is are these cliches about what you literally just said, the cliches about, you don't know who's, you, you never know who's watching. Right. I was told that since I was 10 years old. Right. And I was always like, yeah, yeah. Arsene Wenger's in the crowd. I'm sure whatever at McCurry park, there's no way Arsene Wenger's coming. <laughs> right. But yeah, Arsene Wenger might not be there, but some, you know, some team might be playing on the other field and the coach is walking by and I do something great or whatever, or I'm warming up well or whatever. Right. And, or I'm doing the opposite. And I'm not warming up well. And they automatically would just never look at me again. Right. And so you're spot on with that. But I find so many times that these kids, the, these cliches, they get, they get, you know, tossed around and stuff like that. And they don't, they don't take it seriously. They don't focus on like, honestly, I'm just going to make this, I'm going to call this focus on the cliches. Right. Because if you do that, you have to be set up for success because there's a reason why they're cliches. We're literally telling you guys right now that you know you, you don't know who's watching. You never know who's watching. So always bring your A game. Always warm up properly. Always, always, always be consistent in the way you train, in the way you operate, right? And so, so speak to that a little bit because, I mean, you, you deal with a lot of younger players, right? And And – what the younger you are yeah. in my head, the younger you are, the less consistent you are with your, you know, various, various aspects of your training and your game and all that stuff. What do you tell young players when they might not be as consistent, when they might have unbelievable games and then they just go missing for a couple of games? What do you, what do you tell them? So I have a, I have a couple of stories. So with young kids, uh, there's this one kid that I'm that I'm working with right now. He's young, 15, but playing with the USL team. So it's a big jump. It's first time yeah. with the national team. He's been there. And I have conversations with players when they make that jump from being with the national team to entering pro football. And one of the best quotes I heard was with a player, plays for FC Dallas, Colin Smith, just signed a homegrown contract. And we were talking last year in regards to his USL season. And I was like, hey, Colin, how did it feel to be playing pro now, being with yeah. North Texas? Because you're not protected by FC Dallas anymore. And he was like, I learned the real game of football. And, and I was like, oh, can you expand on that? What do you mean? He was like, yeah, being with a national team, it's cool because we're all buddies. So even though we're competing for spots, we're all friends at the end of the day. Right. He's like, here, I have to earn everything because I'm playing with people who are making a salary, who are, who for me to play, I have to take somebody's spot and I have to earn it. Right. It's not just given to me because when you enter a national team pool, you already have the respect of people being like, okay, yeah, right. you're talented. You earned it. You deserve to be here. When you're 15, 16 playing with grown men, they're automatically looking at you like, Hey, you don't deserve to be here. So we're going to pass the ball harder to you. We're going to tackle you a little firmer. We're going to test you. So that is just intrinsically, you have to believe in yourself. And I always tell my younger guys, have a, have a short mindset, have a mind of a goldfish. 
Because in football, there's there's highs and there's lows. It's a roller coaster. Because you can go and you can have a great game. But it's not consistent. Because just like the Brazilian national team, when we look at the youth Brazilian national team, hundreds of thousands of players have one cap for the senior team. Mm -hmm. But then well, as we go on, like less than 5% of all footballers have 10 caps with the national team. They get yeah. they play one good season, get the call up, play once, done. With the younger players, it's about locking in and just forgetting about bad games and believing in yourself. It's confidence. Like You have to have that confidence within yourself that whether things are going great, you have to go, you have to work harder because now that you've played at that level where you're shining, people start to expect that. So you have to continue to push. You can never rest. You can never take your foot off the gas. And once you do end up in the starting position, keep pushing to make that gap further. Because one of the best quotes I ever heard was, if you don't improve, you're actually getting worse. Yeah. Because there's somebody behind you who's improving and catching. So always have that short, have that short, mind of a goldfish where if i play great forget about it because you can't go back and replay that game you have to play the next game right. and if you have a bad game you have to focus on hey i need to turn this around because i need to get out of this slump as quickly as possible and sometimes it doesn't happen sometimes you have four or five games it happens to every player we're all human we get into those slumps where we're not doing well even for me and even for me as an agent or a scout there'll be sometimes i'm sitting back and i'm just like oh Hmm. Where can I improve this? I feel kind of stuck. And I'll take maybe a day to meditate and just refocus and be like, okay, I need to dive in and do this, or I need to reroute, or I need to refocus yeah. or think, rethink my process. A lot of players <clears throat> need to just stick to the basics. If you're having a bad game, don't try to overcompensate for it because a lot of young players do do that. I've noticed with the senior level guys they they will slow down to play their game, but the younger guys, they feel like if I lose the ball, I have to overcompensate and I have to do something spectacular. Now, the best footballers in the world can just keep the ball. Just keep no. the ball. That's all your team's at. Are you efficient? Can you keep the ball and move it? Right. Can you beat your player? Cross it. Can you be efficient with it? If not, then don't try to overcompensate because then you're going to get into your head and you'll just lose focus. Right. Always believe in yourself and try to just get yourself out of something. And don't be too hard on yourself because it's football at the end of the day. You should enjoy it. It's not a task. It's so, I mean, it's so crazy because I've been really focusing on that myself. Like literally if you have a bad day, like, like just for in general, just think about the gym, right? Like you go to the gym, you don't really want to do anything today or whatever. And you just have like a really bad workout. What I don't, I mean, whatever that means, like you just have a really bad workout, right? Immediately you're thinking tomorrow I have to have a good workout to make up for this workout. And we always have this mindset of like, I have to make up for that. I have to make up, like, I have to do even, I have to do double because yesterday, yesterday I missed the gym. So I have to do double today. But you don't realize that it's just each moment is its own moment. Each day is its own day. It's not a, it's not really a collection of days. Now, if you're not going to the gym for three weeks, four weeks, okay, obviously you're going to start seeing like, you're going to start, start seeing mistakes. But even then, you're not going to be able to just, go to the gym two days and just like re get it all back. You have to make sure that you, each day is its own day and you're trying to make that day the best possible day it can be. Right. And relating that to relating that to football is when you have a bad pass, that is not, it, it is not a, a representation of the whole game. It's a 90 minute match, right? I've, I've given away really bad goals before playing it back to my keeper and a and guy coming in and taking it. Okay. But like, and yeah, that, that, that phased me at the time. But looking back, I look at it and I say, that was one pass. I, made, I might have had 40, 50 passes that game, 40, 50 touches that game. But if I'm just focused on that one, and I've talked to my teams about this, you give away one goal, your head goes down. Now you give away four goals, but you actually only gave away one goal. Then you just, then you just folded, right? So when you're looking at your life, when you're looking at each moment in the game, when you give the ball away, I like I always have this rule. You know, it's a pretty common rule. I always have a rule: don't miss, don't mess up twice, don't mess up twice. So if I miss a pass, I make sure that my next pass is a hundred percent. If I have to play it back to my center back, I play it back to my center back. I don't care because now I have to, I have to win. I have to get a win, right? 
And I hear a lot of people talking about this recently, like, you know, people in business, people in soccer, or whatever. The first thing they do in the morning is they have, they, they get a win somehow, whether that's, they, you know, they, uh, read or whatever. They do something that they say they were going to do. They, they, they get a win right real early in the day because then it sets the tone. Right. So for me, and then I'll, and I'll turn it over to you. I'm talking a lot, but at the beginning of every game, I make sure I keep the ball immediately because it sets the tone for the rest of the game. Right. These are little yeah. mental things during the game that I, that I focus on that when you are, when, when players are so nervous and they're so, they don't want to mess up then they they start thinking that that one pass is now how the whole game looks. It's a 90 minute game. That pass lasted about three seconds and they went in and they got a great chance. And now everyone's yelling at you. But now you have 60 more passes or 60 more touches that you can do something with. And if you, if you, if those, if those next 50 touches are quality, no one remembers the pass. No one remembers the pass. And, and especially if you're a forward listening or, or a center back or whoever listening and you give away a bad goal or whatever, th this happened to me in Germany, first game of the season, ball comes in. I went to go up and head it. I couldn't get up far enough and it just flicked off my head and went in on goal. I literally looked at it. And I said, I, I don't care. It was two minutes in the game. I was like, I don't care. Everyone's like looking at me. Oh, it's okay. I was like, I don't care. It's two minutes in the game. We have 88 minutes. Came back in one, two, one. Yep. No one, no one said a word to me the next day about my own goal. No one, because I focused on getting us back into the game. That was a moment in the game. That was a, a two minute period of time in the game of a 90 minute game. But some of the people listening to this, I'm talking to someone listening to this right now, you give away one pass and you have the worst game of your life because not because of that pass, but because mentally you're still stuck on that pass. And now we're, the game's moving on, but you're still on that pass. So that, that's my, that's my little rant. I'm probably going to clip that, but, uh, um, but no, that, I, I mean, that. You're, you're it's, it's true. yeah, completely true. Like you said, when, when players football is, I would say 85%, 90% mental. Once you're at that level, once you have the talent, the rest of it is mental that takes you there because yeah. like you said there's been so many players who shut down after after one one bad mistake and one club my club arsenal is known for doing this and i don't know why but i always and even me as being a football fan i support arsenal love them the glory days on the invincibles looking at them now when i watch them play i always say to myself if this squad gets scored on first there's no way we can yeah we're back. done and it's a mental thing with them. Like there, there's just a certain, we need a certain drive you need internally. And it's, that's a great mentality to have Andrew. And that's why you, you, and everything you do, Andrew, it's spot on. Every single thing you put your mind to, you're going to do it and you're going to accomplish it. Because I heard a great quote, if you aren't successful, it's literally due to your discipline. Yeah, it's due to your discipline, and it's the small wins that matter. You you put a pinpoint on that. You can yeah. be a football player, and your small wins matter. The bit the mistakes happen. Like even um, other day I was talking to a player, and he was telling me he's like, man, I got my chance to play. This is a fifteen years old, fifteen year olds again playing with USL. He's like, man, we had a scrimmage, but I gave away a penalty. Yeah. And I was like, okay, my reaction is, it's okay, you're young, but how did you react? Right. And the reaction was, I had a good game afterwards. But internally, it's okay to be upset about it. But it's, right. do you keep the ball afterwards? How do right. you react to it? Because as a scout, I'll look at that too and be like, he doesn't have the mental capacity to handle, to handle rough patches. And if you can't, you can't go pro. That's just it. I think, I think. It all comes, and this is what I started realizing now that I'm coaching younger players and so like that. I'm, I just try to look at them from a psychological perspective and say, why, like, why is this kid not over there, right? Why is this kid not on the first team? If he's playing with LA, LA two, why is he not on the first team? What, what's the difference? Now, when you get into the pro game, it's there, there's a, there's a difference, right? You have experienced pros who literally know how to go out and get a win, like they just know how to do it. 
They know how to not give the ball away. They know, like, they're just mentally in a different world, right? But when you're a younger kid and, you know, it's this, like, this is the difference, right? This is the difference. And I always look at it and always comes back to just who, like, two things. Are you passionate and are you a winner, right? Do you, do you, like, when, when I was growing up and my sister, she's seven and a half years younger than me. She never beat me in anything because I would never let her because I'm like, you know what? Two things. First of all, I don't lose. I don't lose to a seven and a half, someone who's seven and a half years younger than me. I don't do that. And third, and second, if she won and I let her win, what is that? What, what's, what's that worth? Worth nothing. So, so she didn't beat me in anything. She's, she's going to be listening to this. She didn't beat me in anything. Um, but going back to like what I, when I look at younger kids and I look at them psychologically, it's, it's all about, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to do this. But what about the things that you want to do? What about the, what about you saying when you go out on the field, it's so easy when you're on the bench to say, Oh, I want to play. But when you get on the field now, do you really want to play? Do you really want to work? Do you really want to grind and tackle and, and, and do all the dirty work? Or do you just do you just sit over here and think to yourself, oh, I can I can do this and I can I'll Maradona him and all this stuff. But when we start kicking and we start pushing, we start shoving, who's willing to fight for the long run? Right. And so so the difference to me is first passion. Right. There are people who come, there are young players who come and show up every single day. We were the same way. We would always show up super early. Both of our dads were coaches. We would show up super early and we just want to we just want to play. I don't even get I don't care what we did. We just want to play whatever. And um, new moves, new juggles, whatever it was. Like, we'd always want to come and play. And so it's the passion to just want to play, regardless of if it's training time or whatever. I just always want to play. And then the second one is, like, I always just want to win. I always want to come out a winner. And it, I might lose this game, but winners, like, I, I, I heard a quote recently. There's winners, there's losers, and there's learners, Right. I, I just learn every single time I go out. If we win 4-0, I'm still like, okay, next time I need to open up a little bit more, try to get that ball over to the right side a little bit more, right? Because I'm always just learning. I'm always just getting better because tomorrow I have to be better than I am today. Like you said, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. There's no staying in the middle. You you can't hold on to what you have. You either you either increase it and improve it or you lose it. Right. So, so the middle doesn't exist. The middle doesn't exist. The middle doesn't, doesn't exist. exist. And so, so if you, if you had like a, you know, and, and I, and I started, I started really being on like this comparison thing, like, like everyone stop being soft. It's okay to compare yourself to other people, but, but you need to be a little bit more mentally tough. Right. So like Johnny over there, he's playing for the first team. Johnny might not be that good, but there's something, there's some reason Johnny's on the first team. Maybe, maybe he has, maybe, you know, Maybe, I, don't, I mean, we're talking about agents. Maybe he has a better agent. Maybe he has Nate compared to, you know, Josh, right? Maybe I need to get a better agent. There's something I have to do to get over there, right? That's it. That's in my. That's how I always think. There's something I have to do to get over there. And when I was at Atlanta, I literally watched these guys every single day. I would sit there on the bike and watch them every single day. Eric Rometty for, for – um, uh, for Atlanta. I would watch him every single day and I'd be like, you know what? He, he's two or three levels ahead of me, but I know what I need to do to get there. Right. And now like life events have changed and you know, that's not my goal anymore, but I saw it and I wrote it down and I was like, this is what I need to be doing to get to that level. Now I need to do it consistently over and over and over again. And it's tough, but there's some, if you're not where you want to be, there's some reason don't just throw your hands up and say, oh, I'm just unlucky. You're not unlucky. You're just not the person you need to be in order to be there. And we always try to learn new, and, new skills, new tricks. But you, you actually have to become that person to be there, especially, especially as a pro. I love that you say that because I had a conversation with uh, – I have this conversation with every single player because as an agent, you're going to have players who reach out to you all the time saying they want right. to be pro. Right. And there's parents who even approach me and are like, my son wants to go pro. And this is everything I always tell players. If your son, if your son just shows up to training, he doesn't want to be a pro. 
if your son just shows up to train, if you have to tell him to get ready to pra- to go to practice, if you have to tell him, hey, you should do extra work, if he doesn't do extra work on his own, if he just practices, goes to training, shows up, I don't care what club he's at. If he's at LAFC, if he's at Inter Miami, if he's at Arsenal, if he just shows up to go to training, goes home, does nothing, he doesn't want to be a pro. And a lot of this is what I experienced with a lot of younger kids. And you touched on this point. It's no coincidence the players are where they are. And people don't believe me when I say that. But if I look at the work that players put in from a younger age group, you touched on it because there are younger kids you see and everybody wants to play. Yeah. But then they're looking at players who are excelling in their age group. And you and I, you you touched on a good point. You and I, our dads are both coaches. Yeah. And I'm sure you've heard the same thing when we were younger because um, Andrew and I, we, I'm not even lying, we're some of the best players in the country in the state. And there would always be rumors I would hear that my dad forces me to train at home. Yeah. Or my dad forces me to do this. Or my dad forces me to do that. And I'm only good because my dad has knows this person or this person. And to me, I would take offense to that because people don't know when I was at my house, I used to kick the ball off the wall and blast it into the other couch breaking photos to the point where my dad would have to be like, you need to stop doing this. Like you need to stop playing. Like you, yeah. you need to just relax. Yeah. And I know the same for you. So it's like, with us, we just love to play. Yeah. And if you're not that player, like when I look at you, if I don't see it now, and I don't know if it's, and there's a lot of games now and there's a lot of kids that I do see now and I feel like it's happening less and less. And I don't know if it's the social media aspect or it's just technology or maybe the way the kids are growing up now, but kids don't play like we used to play or love the game. Like we used to love the game. Like kids struggle doing keep ups now where right. when we were at their age, we're doing 600, 700, right foot, left foot, round the world, like holding the ball on our neck, playing. And when I look at kids now when they can't even do it, and then they're still the best kids in the age group, you're looking at it and you're like, what's going, like mentally, what's going on? Like you say you want to be a pro, but you don't do anything outside the lines to be a pro. And when I look at us growing up, it was no coincidence the players who were great. Right. We would show up early. We would play all the time. We went to school together. Soccer wasn't even cool. And Andrew and I would still be playing soccer while the kids were playing football, things like that, where it's like, if you're not doing 10 times more than what I did, and I didn't even make it as a pro, there's no way you're going to make it. I mean, that, that's, that's the, the key. reality that's the key of, there. of just being football. I mean, th- there are players who don't make it, who are putting in more work than some of these people who are asking to be pro. So it's like, I mean, I mean, it's... It's it's crazy to me because it's so spot on. A a kid, so I coach O nines, right? So eleven and twelve year olds or whatever, eleven year old, <laughs> right? Love that and age so group. Yeah. The other day, or is yesterday, one of the kids from the second team, the ECNL team, stayed after and trained with the O eights, right? And he was he was decent, right? He he played well and you know he, he was physical or whatever. But I looked around and I said, there's a reason this kid's on the second on the second team getting looked at for the first team. And none of the th- 13, 14, 15 players are here. Like, it just it just blows my mind that that and parents are parents are to blame for this. Parents are to blame for this. That you think that you can, you know, cause a fit or cause a ruckus enough that your kid can get moved up, or that you're like that you're gonna be able to get your kid to this level. They're gonna hit a ceiling because the college coach is not gonna allow that, right? You think of I mean, come on, like me that was the first email I got in college was addressed to my parents from my university coach saying, don't call me for anything because I'm not responding to parents. He's ours now. <laughs> well, at, at, like, what point, at what point do these parents think that they're going to be able to let the kids go? Like When if the play to play model stops, bro. I'm telling my, you. My, my dad, my dad was, the, was the director of the club. Never said a word to my coach about anything about me playing or anything like that about – like, you know, I mean, playing up on the older team, it never playing up on the older team or anything like this. Like, like you said, there would always be little, little whispers from parents as well. Parents and players just saying, oh, 
uh, the reason he's so good is because his dad's the coach or whatever. And he like, but what you don't realize, and you know this, what you don't realize it's, it's way harder to be the coach's son. It's way harder. Like there's a lot, there's not many players that can take that. When we moved to Minnesota and my dad was my coach, he'll be listening to this. When my dad was my coach, I got kicked out of every single practice. That was so hard for me. At some point I would just, I just lost it. I was like, I, I mean, I don't even want to play anymore. It was so, it was like, but he knew I could be better. He knew that I needed, like, I was getting yellow cards all the time. He knew that I needed to be, you know, reel it in mentally. Now I'm good. But like at the time it was very difficult. Those were difficult times. And I know they were difficult for him as well. It puts a strain on the relationship that people don't realize. Oh, I wish my dad was the coach so that I can play all the, you don't get it. You don't get it. You don't see, you don't see the, you know, when you come home and it's like, you, you feel like you didn't put enough work in, right? You always feel like you didn't put enough work in, right? Or, you know, uh, my dad was a United or fan. Or the external always... pressure that they hear from. <laughs> exactly. Or the external pressure the dads get from parents saying, you're only playing your son because da, 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 da. 1,000%, bro. 1, but again, again, you're teaching it's, your it's kid. It's not very easy. The, the, the kids regurgitate what the parents say in the car. Right. And I've talked about this many times on the podcast is literally like, you have to realize as a parent that we all have to work together. If the kid is going to be, so if you want the kid to be at the top level, par parents and coaches have to work together. Right. Now, when I went pro, then my dad's, my dad was very influential in my agent decision. Right. And so I really, I trusted him. You know, he's been, he obviously he's been, you know, sort of my, my mentor, my guy since, since I was a kid, obviously. And so I really trusted him with my agent decision and I made a great decision, but at some point as parents, I'm just talking to the parents right now. Cause you know, we're, we're going through tryouts here and it's just, for me, I'm just like, just come on guys. It's about the kids, but, and they don't realize what they have. Honestly, they don't realize what they have, but anyway, looking at the parents and saying, when are you going to let go? When are you going to let go and just let them let them navigate the world of soccer? Because that's what we did. That's what we that's literally what we did. We navigated the world of soccer on our own. We went from this team to this team to this team to this team and just figured it out. Right. Because our dads, were coaches, they knew. And so all we did was just figure it out. I went from team to team to team to team and just figured it out. I won awards along the way. I got injuries along the way. I didn't play sometimes. My my dad didn't agree with it, but he didn't call the coach. He didn't talk to the coach. He didn't pull me out and take me to this club and say, oh, I was able to play for the top team here. No, he said, figure it out. Figure it out. You said you were going to play for this team. Now play for this team and figure it out. Or we don't play soccer anymore. Simple as that. Either you go play basketball or you go play baseball or whatever you want to play. Or you play soccer for this team that you said you're going to play for and you figure it out. And that, that, that helped me throughout my whole career because when I went to college, I played every single minute, freshman, sophomore year, junior year. I only played, or I only started eight games. New coach came in hard on me. Didn't play me. Right. I talked to my dad almost every single day. Like, ah, oh, this is so tough. I want to leave and all this stuff. And he's like, you just got to, you got to figure it out. You got to work harder. You got to figure it out. All this different stuff. Senior year comes, same thing. I'm behind a freshman now. I'm a senior playing behind a freshman. I'm like, here we go again. I'm literally, it's nightmare time. But I pushed through it. The team made it to the Sweet 16. We barely lost to Wake Forest. And now I'm on the all-decade team, whatever, right? And so I look at that. And then my first year as a pro, I sat on the bench every single game, right? So at that point, I knew how to navigate it because I had just been through it. Literally, these parents are crippling their kids because at some point their kid is going to come up against something and they're not going to be able to help them and the kid won't know how to navigate it. So you're literally crippling your child. These parents who want their kids to go pro are crippling them and not they're, they're going to be the reason that they don't make it pro. I mean, we see it all the time. We see it all the time, right? Um, do you have anything to say about that? I kind of want to switch it over to, to players because I'm 
I'm in this yeah. mode right now with tryouts. Let's switch it back to players. players. <laughs> um, how many? How many? Uh, how much do you deal with parents in general? So, as an agent, parents are very important, and you guys all have to be on the same page. Yeah. The now I can tell how far a player will go based on their family. Yeah. So there are there are parents who you can tell push their kid to do things and it's never going to work and the player doesn't have a high ceiling just because it doesn't work. Now, this is me from the beginning because my players that I start out with are younger because I'm only right. 25, so it doesn't right. make sense for me to represent players my age. So they're around 18 between 20 and under. So yeah. the parents that I meet, I always introduce myself and we have to work together because right. I always tell parents as well, as an agent, I'm not trying to come in and decide your child's future because right. one, it's his future. Two, you guys had plans for him before I even came into the picture. Right. Three, my job as an agent is to put your child in the best positions to facilitate deals for him or facilitate anything so he can accomplish all of his footballing dreams. Right. So I cannot do that without the parents on my side because they know the football player better than I ever will. Like, yeah. for instance, you have a good agent, but you're the first phone call you're probably going to make is to your dad. Right. Re religiously, you're going to continue to call your dad. So your parents are going to be the ones who know the ins and outs of the child. So I have to work with them. Right. Um, but like I said, when parents start to dictate what happens with their child, right? that is when... I would step away as an agent because I also choose who I represent. It's not, right. it's, 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 it's synced. Like we can never work together if you don't trust me to have your child's best interest and your child doesn't trust me to get the proper deals for him. Right. So if your parents come and it happens all the time, like even especially with boot deals and like club deals. So say for instance, a kid has been playing for so long at this club, so long at this club and their parents try to force a contract for them at this club because they know, oh, my dad supports this club, my mom supports it, I grew up here in the academy, but you know there's no realistic future for him. Right. And if I come with a deal that's proposed, hey, you can go, you could go play here instead, you're gonna get 50% of the playing time, you're young, but you have a realistic chance of turning pro, the parents will be like, no, we want him to stay, 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 and if the child wants to go, then it just becomes too much of a risk. So with right. parents, I love families actually because we do have to get along and I understand that. There are some agents who hate parents. I can tell you that right now. There are some agents who hate parents. I like letting parents and the family decide the decisions. Well, here are the offers that are at hand for their player, but ultimately it's between the player, myself, and really the family's decision. If, if, Mostly if, the if player is number if, one. If you guys work together, that's a superpower. Like that's literally like at that if if you if the parents buy into what you're saying and the kid buys into what you're saying and you guys have that harmony, it is a it is a completely like it, it it's exponentially better for the kid. Exponentially. So parent like again, I mean, we're gonna get off parents in a second, but to parents, literally, if you just put your ego aside and stop living, trying to live through your kid and just realize, okay, this guy who works his, works his butt off every single day, making connections, networking, and, and using these different avenues to help kids achieve their dreams. If I just get, put my ego aside and just trust him and be like, okay, whatever is best, whatever you believe is best for him, we will support it. And if it works great, if it doesn't, we'll be here. If you did that, your kid would be you wouldn't even real like you would be like, wow, how did my kid make it to this level? It's because you got out of the way and you put your ego aside and you just became parents and not try to be agents, coaches, physios, all at the same time. Just be parents. That's my I mean, anything you have to say about that? No, nope, that is completely it. Once once because parents want the best for their child. And I'll tell you this from a business standpoint for parents as well. If you do not have a soccer background or if you're not educated into negotiating contracts or anything like that, right. clubs will take advantage of you because one, 
when they know they're dealing with parents when it comes to contract negotiation they know they can offer parents whatever because most likely the parents aren't going to be an agent for a long time so they don't have to do dealings with them it's just one player so they will offer them contracts that they know parents are not in the player's best interest or the player can get a little bit more just for that reason also another thing is parents tend to react on more of so emotion and clubs 100%. do play on that. So if I know, like, for instance, if I know your child has been here forever and parents also don't want to let their children down and make that bad decision. So it's easier for you guys to step away. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with parents being day-to-day -day managers of their children, whether that's, yeah. oh, I need to get like, oh, I know for instance, hey, Nate, um, Josh needs this and this done for his game. So can we make sure that these play people are on the list for his game? Make sure he has this, make sure he has this, make sure he has water, make sure he has boots, make sure these people are, make sure these people have tickets. Yes, that's fine. But when it comes down to like negotiations and stuff, parents, they just have to trust that it'll be in their child's best interest. Exactly. So, so that's interesting what you say. Like, I don't, it, it's okay if they're in there with their managing their day to day lives. I mean, dads and moms have managed their day to day lives since they were three years old. So they know it in and out. They know that. But it's when they be they believe that I know my child best. So I'm going to coach him. I'm going to be his physio. I'm going to be his agent. I'm going to do all these different things. But how are you how are you versed in negotiating contracts? How are you versed in, you know, playing 90 minute matches at a high level? Where 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 is that happened in your parenting career? However, we got to get off the parenting thing. I have a question from, from someone uh, about goalkeepers, right? Two things. What do you, oh, do you perfect? Do you have any goalkeepers on uh, as clientele? And what do you look for in a goalkeeper? So goalkeepers, I do not. And the reason being, it has nothing to do with talent of goalkeepers. It has to do with my age. So me personally this is a personal goal of mine i will share it with you guys i want to have an agency no bigger than two players per position one being an older player one being a younger player just because some players are set to where they need to be but if a club needs one player i want to be able to have another player ready to go always on the move when yeah. it comes to goalkeepers they take a little bit longer to mature so in regards to goalkeeping I will say this, what I am asked as a scout when I've been asked for goalkeepers, because I have, that's different, whether there's been players on my roster or not, I've been asked to look at goalkeepers. And one of the things that I've noticed that clubs ask for a lot now is keepers that can use their feet. 100%. That is one thing that I get all the time. Can the keeper use their feet? Are they agile? Yeah. Can they move? like vertically laterally and can they command their box three things can they use their feet can they command their box and are they agile if you're none of those things it won't work also yeah. if you're a great keeper but you're silent you need to command your box if you are a great keeper and you have great hands that's great and all but for keepers especially at the pro level you touch the ball more with your feet so if you can't kick the ball past half you need to work on your goal kicks. You need to get the ball. If you're not accurate with your passes, you definitely need to work on that. So definitely work on your, your footwork. I can tell you guys right now, I was watching Inter Miami's first team train. The goalkeepers are doing a session. Everyone's using their feet. They're working out of building the ball out of the back. Yeah. They're playing the ball back and forth, swinging it, swinging it 50, 60 yards, both, both feet. So that's just for keepers to know, hey, definitely – I do, I do plan to have two keepers on my roster. I really do because keepers are, keepers are really underrated in regards to just football in general and not getting the yeah. credit that they deserve. And, and it is very, very hard to be a great keeper. It, it's very hard. But if you can a very your mental position. command your box, yes. And if you, if you can use your feet, command your box, be a leader and be agile, you're gonna you're gonna go far you're gonna go we, far we you haven't have even talked about we haven't even talked about shot stopping that's the thing right like i tell i tell no I, I i tell i tell players outfield players and goalkeepers alike 
there are things that you can do that don't even require you to even have the ball at your feet. Like for a goalkeeper, work on your goal kicks, work on your, your voice, work on commanding the box. Did I talk about shot stopping there? Did I talk about making one on one saves one on one and stuff like that? Yes, obviously that would be amazing, but you can go to a much higher level. If you just get those three things right before we even talk about shot stopping to me personally, don't go to goalkeeper training until you're 14 years old. I don't give a rats if you if you can sh stop shots at 12 or whatever. That's cool. That's that's dope. I in my opinion, I think that's more natural though. If you're 12 and you're a shot stopper, I think that's just natural. But you need to be working on your goal kicks. You need to be working on playing out of the back. You need to be basically a field player at that point. That's my that's just my opinion. I that that is it because, like you said, at that top level. Shot stopping is a given. That's just like saying, can you pass the ball left and right? You know what I mean? Can you pass the ball with your strong foot and weak foot? Nobody's going to say that about a keeper. Because even if you don't, because the way football games work now, how often do we really see a keeper making eight, nine, ten saves a game? It's very rare that you'll see a keeper that's under duress making eight or nine saves a game. You're seeing him mostly with the ball, with the ball at his feet, how he's commanding his area, and then you'll may see the, this is the, this is a true stat. Keepers in the last World Cup touched the ball eleven times with their feet before they made a save. I mean, there you so go. if you're touching the ball eleven times with your feet, you're making one save maybe. So, and it's a given that he's a good goalkeeper. Like we we just in in scouts' minds, if you're in goal already. The assumption is you can make a save. You have right. to that. That's the thing. Yeah, that's, that's the, the thing. bare minimum requirement. So you, so you focusing too much on shot stopping and shot saving. I'm never saying you shouldn't, but if you don't have the other tangibles, it, you're not a complete project. And 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 I say the same thing for field players as well. I say stop watching Messi on the ball. Start watching Messi the other 95 percent of the time. Like just watch what he does when the ball is not at his feet. We all watch Messi when the ball is at his feet. God, he's the GOAT and all this stuff. Yeah, cool. He's the second best player to ever play the game. But the 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 key for me is 95% of the time, he's looking for space. He's moving. He's he's uh he's you know talking, he's organizing. Like I can do that. I can do that. The 95% of the things Messi does, I can do. So imagine if I started focusing on that more and focusing less on, oh, I just watch Messi and I just watch him as a fan or whatever. Same with goalkeepers. Instead of trying to be Manuel Neuer and trying to, you know, first of all, I think it's, I mean, I think he's the luckiest goalkeeper of all time that he's made it this far in his career because the things he does is it's absolutely idiotic, but he gets away with it. Congrats to him. Try that in the Premier League. You won't have a chance, but um but the thing, but the thing with him is like everyone watches him and they see the unbelievable saves. He makes unreal saves, right? Very athletic guy. But he makes maybe one save every three or four games. That's just unbelievable. Maybe even five games, just unbelievable. So why am I going to spend most of my time trying to trying to make that save when it's only going to happen once every five games? I need to be working on my goal kicks. I need to be working on playing out of the back. I need to be working on commanding my box and talking to players and. All. These are things that you can work on at your house. These are things that you can work on with literally your mom just throwing the ball up and you going and get it. Like literally, it's so simple. And we, we complicate this process, whether you're a goalkeeper or a player, you, you just complicate the process too much. Just do the simple things. Just master the simple things. Just do them unbelievably well where I can't even mess up even if I tried. Like just master those things. Stop making simple mistakes connect passes as a goalkeeper, connect passes, be able to kick the ball long, be able to play that ball that you want to play, just like a center back would or a center defensive mid would play, play like that, connect passes. Don't give the ball away in front of your own, uh, in front of your own goal, like little things like that. Keep the ball out of the net with you, with your feet, different things like that. We, we overcomplicate this process so, so much. Yep. Completely agree. Um, so I want to jump into this for the last five minutes. Um, you, you touched on a, uh, a bit at the beginning about agents having a bad rap, uh, how you want to do it properly. And I just want to jump into that quickly because I think that's, I think that's huge. 
And that's why for me from afar, I'm like, oh, I I'm clapping for you because that's what I, that's, you know, it's, it's cool that you're an agent, right? It's cool that you're an agent, but the fact that you're doing it right and you're doing it well, and you're actually building a strong foundation, not just trying to get a quick buck here, a quick buck there and saying that I work with this guy and all that stuff. It's good to see that, that it's going to be, it's, there's that longevity to it. Right. And so just talk about that a little bit. Like, how are you doing it? How are you doing it right compared to what other, you know, other, other agents that we, we tend to think about what, what are they doing differently? So I would say one thing that I've noticed about life in general is relationships matter. So, and I always put myself in this mentality where I need to play chess when people are playing checkers, yeah. because if you want to do something for a long period of time, the relationships that you build and more so importantly, it's what people say about you when you're not around. That is what's going to take you further. So there have been situations where I've turned down working with top players because I don't like their, I don't like the way they portray themselves. I don't like the way clubs work. I don't like the way that a club has done a dealing. And I've been offered some, some substantial amounts of money and some, and some wild places for players to play. But I know that that contract is not good for a player. Like I've been. I've been offered contracts to like Israel, um, Bosnia, some Azerbaijan, looking to pay millions of dollars in agent fees. Millions of dollars in agent fees for players when you're looking at it, you're like, this is this is like ex on the borderline of extortion. Right. Or something as simple as not supporting your player. Like there's a lot of agents. And I tell younger kids this because it happens to young kids all the time. And I always have, there's, there's big agencies and there's boutique agencies. I'll tell you guys the difference. So a big agency, like let's take a Wasserman Stellar group. You're one of the top players at a young age. You're going to have meetings with them. You probably are going to be approached by an agent like me, if not me. We know who you guys are already. So you don't really have to hunt for an agent. We'll find you. But what's going to happen is, you're going to be one of the top players. You're going to see a roster of all these players there. And you're going to be more intrigued to sign with them because you're looking at their roster and you're looking at this client list and you're like, man, I want to be a part of that. Why wouldn't I want to be a part of that? But then this is what it goes, it goes back to when the going gets tough, are they still going to be there? And there's so many stories and there's so many players that reach out to me from even Atlanta United, there's been multiple players um, that, you know, Logos Kunga reached out to me yeah. and he messaged me and he's like, yo, it's a blessing that I found you. Like yeah. at that level, because he was with um, one of the biggest agencies in North America. I'm not gonna say the agency's name just because I don't want to throw other agencies names out there where they have a big clientele list, big roster yeah. list. And then he was one of Atlanta United's first homegrown, signed the contract. Atlanta United got rid of him and he's like, it, it's, he's like, yo, like, it's kind of impossible for me to contact my agent. Yeah. The only time I heard from him was when I said I wanted to fire him. And then he tried to put in more work for me, but I still barely heard from him. Yeah. And there's thousands of stories I hear like that because I will tell players this. If you're a talented player, it doesn't necessarily matter what agent you go with to a certain extent. Right. Because clubs will find you and clubs know who you are. Right. So if you have an agent who you get along with, who's, who's been there for a while, who doesn't show up when you've made it, because for me as an agent, I'll let you guys know, I'm looking at 06s, 07s, 05s, not working with them, but just looking at them, having conversations with some families, not signing them or anything, that's illegal, but it's just like, I'm looking that deep into seeing, talking to their coaches. Hey, how's he as an 07? It's a far way off, but I right. want to know the, as much about a player before I even approach them. Just knowing little things like, oh, you have a brother, your brother's birthday is this date. Right. Reaching out to moms for Mother's Day, dads for Father's Day. Just making right. sure everything's okay so we build a relationship that's actually authentic, as opposed to me seeing Oh my God, let me look up the national team list for the 0 right. who got called into national team camp. 
okay, this player got called into national team camp. Let me just throw on my logo shirt, reach out to him, DM him on Instagram. Hey, this is who I represented. This is the deals I've done. I can do this for you. Because who's to say when you break your leg, something happens. Right. Now you can't contact me. Now you can't hear from me. You don't know. Yeah, I have a great roster list, but then you also have to look at look at the roster list and look at how many players who have signed and where are they now? Right. Where 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 are those guys now? Are they still playing? Are they gone? Do are they still with that agency? Because when you're the hottest prospect, it's like anything. Even for relationships with girls, you're, exactly. you're the best looking, you're the top athlete. All the girls are here, but then you break your leg. Who's there for you? The exactly. people who've been there for the longest. And even as an agent, also make sure your agent's registered. And also another thing, players, if you look, if you look, you're going to find me on the registry. When you're looking for agents, don't send an email to every single agent on the list saying, hey, I want to go pro. This is my CV. Can you help me? Because one, I see all of the other agents' names in the thread. Two, you didn't take the time to even research who you're trusting with your career, so I can't trust you because right. that's just like you saying, any, any, anyone is worthy of taking care of my career. Any single person, it doesn't matter. You're on the list, but definitely make sure that at the end of the day, your agent is someone you can trust who's reliable and that you guys get along with them and they can be with you through thick and thin. And they have connections as well because if you have an agent who doesn't have connections, or you don't trust or isn't a hard worker because this is what I tell players put in the work on the field and don't worry about anything. I will set everything up. Like oh. I've had meetings all this week so that if I have players playing on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I know what channel and where these clubs in Europe can find their games right now. I was talking to clubs right now and I was like, Hey, their games are streaming in your country on YouTube. You can watch it or you can go back and watch it. I have this player playing at this time. This is their time for you. You guys definitely need to watch. And if you don't feel like your agent's putting in that work for you, then why would you trust them to do why would you trust them to do it? And all because an agency has a big roster doesn't mean that's the best agent for you as well. I mean, at the end of the day, you said it perfectly. Like, it's literally like having any other relationship. Like, how? Why am I going to put in work when this when my, when my friend is just sitting there? As long as I'm on top, they're they're there. We would all look at that and say, "That's not a good friend." Yet we sign with agents who do the same thing. And so I think you said two things. I think it's spot on that you guys need to start taking your career more seriously and start investing in your own career mentally not even like not even monetarily but like mentally like this is the whole like this is what it is this is my career if i truly want to go pro i have to look at it like a career like a job like literally if you want to go work at amazon or whatever you have to go through training and then you get a chance to do it and then you have to get better as you're in that thing right so if you're if you're a a, a mail worker and you're you're delivering mail you have to do, you have to get your job done, right? Like you can't just, no, actually it's raining outside today. So I don't really want to go deliver the mail. That's what a pro is. That's what a professional is <laughs> get the work done when it's not convenient. So if I'm going to do that, my agent better be doing that. And that was my number one criteria for my agent is I said, as long as you work as hard as I work, we'll be good. We'll be good to go. And that's what happened. And I was really blessed, but it, to be fair, it's, it, you know, they're not all like that. You, you know, you, you yeah. said it perfectly. Like, and I've seen it time and time again, I've seen it. I watch the MLS, the MLS draft. I see who they're signing with and it's, it's typically the same, you know, the same group of agents. And it's like, for me, I'm like, I I've, I've seen this too many times. They bet on, they bet on 15 guys and hope that three of them go to the moon, right? <laughs> and so that, that's how it is, guys. So you guys gotta need, you guys need to learn the game. You need to learn the game, Bef uh, just like you said, before you get into, uh, before you get into bed with an agent, you need to make sure that you have vetted them, that you have uh, create a relationship with them. Like you said, create a relationship. 
Stop going in and saying, I want to be a pro. What can you do for me? Just say, hey, and Nate, I, Nate, I noticed your Instagram. I love your Instagram. I think it looks amazing. I, I heard you on the podcast. Um, you know, you, you laid down some really good things. I would love to, to speak further. What in that made it seem like I want something from you? I literally just want to chat. And exactly. you're, you're the type of guy who would be like, yeah, absolutely. Let's set up a time. If it, I mean, exactly. that's it. I just gave you guys the blueprint. There you go. It's, it's, it's not, it's, it's really not hard to get a response from agents. If it's genuine, it's just like anything in life. If you're genuine, you're going to get a response. Also, if you are looking to do anything quickly and never, ever feel pressured by an agent, right. like you guys should know this. And this is the way I work myself. After a meeting with a player for the first time, second time, third time, I don't even talk about really signing them. It's just about getting to know them. It's like with any relationship. You're not going to meet a girl the first night and be like, hey, I want you to be my girlfriend. Exactly. You're not going to propose to them. You're not going to sign their, you're not going to sign, oh, uh, you're not going to sign your lease with her. You're not going to marry her. You're not going to propose to her on the first night. You guys need to get through the honeymoon phase because there are some agents that are also, they give up easily. Right. Like. They can, they'll meet you, you'll, you'll have a conversation one night, disappear, you'll never hear from them again because you didn't sign. It's like, yeah, right. I've spoken to you, we had one meeting, I disappeared, we, you never heard from me again because I didn't sign. But it's like, the agents who are consistent, always reaching out, even if you don't sign with them, hey man, how are you doing? I saw, it. congrats, good luck on your career, I'm still following you, I'm still supporting you. If you need anything, let me know. Those are the conversations that you guys need to have and you guys need to really think about because you should treat an agent relationship as you would treat your spouse exactly. or any relationship. You shouldn't jump into anything or like you said, you shouldn't jump into anything and you guys need to do your research on what's actually going on in the football world. So I have your Instagram handle right there above your head. What? Where can people find you? Where can people contact you? Perfect. So you guys see my Instagram handle. You guys can always send me a DM on my Instagram. There is a link to everything that I do. You'll see my website. My email is also on there as well. I'm also going to add my clubhouse to it as well because my clubhouse has my email. My clubhouse actually has my full CV of where I've scouted, who I've scouted for the um, clubs that I've worked with, what I've done, sent players from here to there, A to Z. You guys can also, um, even if you guys are just looking for agents, you guys want to take a list, the USSF registered agents list. Yeah. If you guys are looking to know where I actually am registered because FIFA doesn't hold it anymore, it's USSF. You'll find me there under my name. But yeah, definitely Instagram is the best way. You can send me a DM. You can find me there. I am on Clubhouse as well. I'm on Twitter. All the same handle, Nate Leader SMG. And um, yeah, guys, I follow Andrew as well. So if you just type in Nate, I'm sure you guys will find me. There you go. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Again, we've had you on the IG live. We've had you on the, the webinar for team replay. I mean, and we go in again, we did it again. So I really appreciate you coming on, uh, a wealth of knowledge and it's good to have, a. it's good to, good to see that you're doing well. Good to see you're doing it correctly. Like I said before, good to see that you're doing it right. And uh, yeah, man, I'm over here clapping for you. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, man, thank you. Keep grinding. And I see I see your crippled move. Your, um, not even that, your crypto moves as well, bro. Yeah. I'm going to the moon with you. We're going to the moon <laughs> together. <laughs> All right. I'll see you. I appreciate it, man. We'll, we'll talk All soon. Right. Yeah, Peace. definitely. Take care. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, guys. This is the Offside Podcast. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button. And we will see you guys next week. Peace.